a land of mists and of mystery, where the cross had yet to reach. Beyond the pagan frontier of medieval Europe, where the old gods confronted the new. Christian crusades, but far from the deserts of Palestine. A wilderness of forests, ice and snow. The Northern Crusades. The Crusades didn't only go east to the Holy Land, they went northeast to the Baltic. Lost castles, last stands. No quarter asked nor given. It's a war with no holds barred. A war nearly two centuries long, fought by one of the most powerful military orders. One of the most important religious military orders. A savage war and an inhuman trade. These people had been slaves of the devil. They are now the slaves of God. For God and for the empire, they bore the cross of Christ. The brothers of the German hospital of St. Mary who became the order of the Teutonic Knights. The Black Cross of the Teutonic Knights is one of the icons of the Christian Crusaders in the medieval period. They were one of the major military orders in the latter years of the Crusader era. They came into being almost a century after the taking of Jerusalem in the First Crusade, when the first of the new military orders were formed, the Templars and the Hospitallers. The Teutonic Order is quite different from either the Templars or the Hospitallers. They did combine the Hospitaller and military functions from an early time in their history. The Templars and Hospitallers recruited from numerous nations across medieval Europe, mostly in France, Italy and England. But the Teutonic Order was different. The brothers of the German Hospital of St. Mary. The Teutonic Knights are the only order that are known as a Teutonic Order, as a German Order. The others are not known as French Orders or whatever. The German Order rose to eventually become one of the most powerful of the Middle Ages. They grew into far more than just a military order. They became virtually an independent, autonomous state. The zenith was in the 15th century, by which time the whole of Europe had changed so much since the days of the original Kingdom of Jerusalem. The written word, trade and gunpowder had brought new ideas, emergent nations, and new alliances. Inevitably, today the word Teutonic evokes images of the worst of the 20th century. The imagery and romanticized legends of the order were appropriated by the Nazis to enhance the myth of their Aryan heritage. It would be wrong to put into this period some of the racist attitudes that developed later and which are sadly still around. It was not like that. On the other hand, the German knights, and they were mostly Germans, did see themselves as superior. But this was on the basis of culture and religion and so on. During the Second World War, places associated with this mythical Aryan past became targets for the enemies and eventual overthrowers of the Third Reich. And so, much of what remained of the original Teutonic Order was lost. It's the job of professional historians to see back beyond the associations of the 20th century, to find what factual evidence remains and build up an unbiased picture of this period in European history, especially in the order's historical heartland. Teutonic Order created a very modern and rich structure here in Prussia in the Baltic region as an eternal enemy of the Polish state, of the Polish kingdom in the Middle Ages. And this history was so fascinating. The wars, the battles, diplomacy, politics. So when I decided what to do in my life, the, it was simple for me to be a historian of the Teutonic Order to know its history and to explain why 
so small group of knights built so powerful state in medieval Europe. It's a vast and complex area of study, but historians now are bringing dedicated research to shed new light on the real story of the Teutonic Knights. The order's origins lay in the Third Crusade. Through the 1180s, the Muslim leader Saladin had steadily regained most of what the First Crusaders had established in Palestine just over 80 years before, including the holy city of Jerusalem. At the Battle of Hattin, Saladin had also virtually destroyed the main force of the original military order, the Knights Templar. In 1189, the three most powerful monarchs in Western Europe set out to retake the holy places for Christianity. Richard I, the Lionheart of England, Philip II of France, and Frederick Barbarossa, Emperor of Germany. The Crusade reversed many of Saladin's gains, though Jerusalem itself was not recaptured. Worse, Frederick Barbarossa died before he even reached the Holy Land, causing many of his leaderless soldiers to return home. But not all. Some continued on to honor their commitment and their dead emperor. You have the survivors of the German part of the Third Crusade reach the Holy Land and attach themselves to the French and to the English because they are too few and now too disorganized, too vulnerable to really operate on their own. It is they who become the Teutonic Knights after the Crusade. In the newly recaptured Crusader city of Acre, these knights established themselves as the brothers of the German hospital of St. Mary. From the end of the 12th century and through the 13th, the brothers received sanction from the Pope and thus became the Teutonic Knights. Like the Templars and Hospitallers before them, the order created its own rule, the guide and laws by which its brothers had to abide. And in this lies a factor that helps historians today in researching the Teutonic Knights, by comparison with the other two major military orders. They were a much more literate order than the other two, perhaps because they started off using the vernacular. Being almost entirely of one nationality, the Teutonic Order wrote down its rules and histories in vernacular German, the language of the everyday brothers. Rather than the more exclusive language of the clergy and papacy, Latin. Although the other two start off with their documents in Latin and then translate them in the vernacular, the Teutonic Order appear to have started with material in the vernacular and then translated it into Latin for wider distribution. So they produced more material than either the Templars or the Hospitallers did for their own brothers to read, saints' lives and histories. The Templars never wrote down their own history, and the Hospitallers' legend made outrageous claims. The Teutonic Knights, by contrast, were more realistic. They didn't make up the myths like the Hospitallers did. They stuck to recent history. So in that respect, they come across as being quite a rational order rather than one that invents miracles, although their stories do have miracles in them. But they feel like an order, much more had their feet on the ground. The city of Acre was the capital of the Crusader state for almost exactly a hundred years until once more, resurgent Muslim forces recaptured most of the Holy Land. Acre was the last city to fall. Most of the remaining members of the other military orders, including the Templars and Hospitallers, went down fighting on the wall, but not the Teutonic Order, with their perhaps more rational ethos. All the military orders who existed in Acre at the time of the final siege and the fall of Acre, they all fought and the city fell. We know, however, that the Teutonic Knights headquarters, which they called their convent, actually negotiated its surrender to the victorious Muslims, the Mamluk army, which had broken in and the survivors left. So in a way, the Teutonic Knights went out with a bit of a whimper rather than a bang. However, 
Once Acre had fallen and the survivors had reached Cyprus, which is where most of them went, they all had the same problem. What to do now? All the military orders had to reassess and look for new purpose. New frontiers where they could defend Christendom or expand it. For the Teutonic Order, the distant east had been reluctantly abandoned. Its new goal lay much closer to its homelands in Germany. The Crusades were not just a phenomena of the Middle East. Crusading didn't just go east to the Holy Land. It obviously went south into what is now Spain and Portugal, but the most dramatic of these other Crusades were the Northern Crusades in the Baltic. The Northern Crusades, which took place around the Baltic, were concentrating on converting the pagan peoples around the Baltic to Christianity, because they hadn't been converted to Christianity, and taking over valuable territory. The Baltic region in the Middle Ages, relative to the parts of Europe it bordered, was a wilderness. Settlements had changed relatively little since Viking times. Society was tribal and clan-based. Yet running through the region were important trading routes. From the Baltic Sea, all the way along the Great Rivers, to the Black Sea and far beyond. Furs, ivory, silver, gold. The neighboring and expanding kingdoms of Denmark, Sweden, Poland and the German Empire had all made inroads into the Baltic, at least since the 12th century. And the Christian cross was a convenient ban. They're not trying to recover territory that had been Christian. They're trying to take over territory that wasn't Christian and they say win it for Christ. Or at least the Latin church will take it over or to be a little bit more blunt, the merchants of the Baltic area will take it over because these areas open the door into the vast trade routes of Central Asia. For the military orders and the church, what made this easier to contemplate was that the Baltic peoples, so close to Western Europe, were still far from Christian. Paganism survived in northeastern Europe for a very, very long time, well into the 14th century. The eastern shoreline of the Baltic, that's what's now the Baltic states, but also Finland, this was pagan territory. Well into the 12th century for all of it. And then it becomes the new crusade frontier. So the crusade idea, as it were, got a second wind, a second life, in the Baltic. The distant Holy Land was forgotten, with so many unrepentant pagan states so close to the European heartland. And so the crusading idea was reborn. The Northern Crusades went on for much, much longer than the Holy Land Crusades did. They became a way of life, almost self-perpetuating. And in fact, the Northern Crusades went on for so long that they structured the whole of the Eastern Baltic around them. So what exists today, the states which exist today, and the tensions which still exist today, can be traced back to the Northern Crusades. One state in the region did not survive to this day as a sovereign nation. When the Teutonic Knights were aiming to expand towards the Baltic, Prussia lay directly in their sights. It's now associated with Germany, but in the 13th century, Prussia was ferociously independent, and it bordered Christian Poland. The Prussians, the original Prussians, are not Germans. They are another Baltic people. The Poles didn't seem to be able to cope with these very fierce pagans on their northern frontier. So they invited in Western Knights to help them. The Teutonic Knights filled this gap. The Poles would have liked to have got their hands on Prussia. They brought the Teutonic Order in to help them, which possibly was a mistake. All the main military orders faced the problem of being dependent on existing nations. For the Templars, always under the eye of the French kings, it led to their downfall. 
The hospital has perhaps learned from this and based themselves on the island of Rhodes. Prussia was the opportunity the Teutonic Knights had been waiting for to establish their own territorial state. Start from scratch if you can. This they were able to do in the Baltic area by getting a castle, one castle, from the King of Poland because he needed their help. But on the agreement, only on the agreement, that they were independent in this one castle. And it was from this one castle that the whole of the Teutonic Knights state, which was quite big eventually, grew. The fortress of Chulm was on the Polish frontier facing the pagan Prussians. The Teutonic Knights took over the castle and began an extraordinary period in the history of the military orders. Over more than a hundred years, the Teutonic Order built up and consolidated what became virtually an independent medieval state. And far enough from the German Emperor, and even further from the Pope, that they could do as they pleased. Some of what remains of the Teutonic state can still be seen across the modern-day Baltic countries. A state required a capital, and in modern-day Poland, Malberg Castle is a reminder of the Teutonic Order's strength and influence. For any Teutonic warrior who had seen the Holy Land, he would have thought the warfare in the Baltic drastically different. The environment, the ecology of the area was so different that you can imagine warriors who had some experience of the Middle Eastern Crusades having a certain mindset finding themselves in the Northern Crusades, trying to use this method of warfare, and then having very quickly to modify it, because that world is totally, totally different. We have an image of Crusaders fighting in armor in the arid terrain of the Middle East. Water supplies for armies was a constant problem. And the military orders of the Kingdom of Jerusalem spent decades learning how to campaign in such conditions. Transfer this to the Baltic area. There are large areas, not only of marsh and forest, but also of heathland. Relatively dry, relatively open. That's the bit you can get through. But you only have to go a relatively few kilometres you find yourself in another forest and then you have to hack your way through it. You can't really make a road because by the time you come back to do a similar campaign the following year, it's all overgrown again. So a large part of these raiding campaigns were just hacking your way through the undergrowth. Their opponents too were different to those the Crusaders faced in the Holy Land, where war was propagated on both sides by knights or at least nobles and professional soldiers. Wars in Prussia and Livonia were against an enemy who didn't play by the same sort of rules as the Arabs and the Turks. The Turks and the Arabs were from the same sort of warrior background. When you're fighting against the pagan Prussians, they are warriors, but they don't mind burning their captives alive on their horses, for example, and the Muslims wouldn't do that. So it's more of a war with no holds barred and a much more violent war than that in the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the other Crusader states. In Palestine, warfare had been dominated by cavalry. The military orders came into being as horsemen who could protect the pilgrim routes from Western Europe, ranging long distances along the frontiers, protecting against enemy raiders. In Prussia, though, this role was reversed. In the Baltic, the kind of warfare that they were conducting was really just a development of, of raiding. A classic strategy of the Middle Ages was what was known as a chevauché, which is like a flying column of, of cavalry and its supports, used to, to raid and put pressure on a population. And of course, that's what happened in the Baltic states a lot. The chevauché was used to great effect by English troops during the Hundred Years' War where they would penetrate for miles through enemy-held territory, plundering and causing chaos as they went. For the Teutonic raiders, it was the ideal way to destabilize Prussia and to gradually take it over. 
but it also brought another commodity beyond just looted food or silver. This is a form of economic warfare. You're destroying the enemy's crops. You're capturing their livestock. You're capturing their people. So in fact, taking captives as slaves was very, very important for both sides. So we have these Christian knights, members of a military order on slave raids. It's a mistake to think warfare is ever clean. When it's being done under a religious banner, by not just the Teutonic Order, but several neighboring Christian kingdoms, for us looking back now, it's even harder to accept. The Northern Crusades look much more like colonialism than the Crusades to the Holy Land, because those that go there are going to trade and take slaves to exploit the area. They did settle there, they did set up holy sites there to bring in pilgrims, but it's not land that's traditionally been Christian. And the emphasis was on getting resources out for the benefit of Germany, Denmark, Sweden. Since the Knights Templar became the first military order, the technology of war had also changed considerably. Technology and technological advantage and superiority was as key to medieval warfare as it is to modern warfare. In the early days of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, knights fought dressed little different to Viking warriors with virtually the same weapons. The Teutonic Knights of the early 15th century were unrecognizable for the original Templars, and you're talking about people with full plate armor exactly the kind of armour that was worn at Agincourt, for example, and heavily armoured horses as well, conducting warfare, usually against much more lightly armoured opposition. As with all the military orders, knights, the main armoured soldiers who comprised the Teutonic Order's core battlefield troops, were relatively few in number. Yet in the Northern Crusades, the armoured knight on horseback could never dominate in the terrain of the Baltic. They needed the support of infantry. Who were these infantry? Well, some of them were sergeants, brother sergeants. Others were mercenaries. Others were low status associates of the order. There were also levies from the towns under um, the control of the orders. But one kind of weapon gave infantry even more killing power. In the 15th century, there's no doubt that it, infantry becomes stronger in relation to cavalry and because they possess more missile weapons and they're capable of standing their ground. Here again, technology was on the side of the Teutonic Order. This was not just their castle building activity and the speed and effectiveness of that. It was also things like siege machines and almost above all else, crossbows. English longbowmen had proved time and again that disciplined infantry, armed with missile weapons, could dominate the medieval battlefield. Yet the longbow took years of training to master, whereas the crossbow was simpler to use. It was a level that almost anyone could learn to use relatively quickly, like the firearms of future centuries. To understand the role of the crossbow armed infantry, it might be good to see them as a sort of early form of musketeer. These are not repeating weapons. It takes time to reload, span, aim, shoot. So you need teamwork. You have a front rank, you have loaders. It's also not like longbow archery, and certainly not like the archery techniques of Asia and the Middle East, where they are shooting rapidly, and they shoot and they shoot and they shoot. It's not like that with a crossbow. It's one aimed shot, punchy, hugely powerful, takes time to reload. Prussia was steadily overwhelmed, and its lands came under Teutonic control. It was a process of penetrating as far as they could through the Prussian interior then establishing small forts, bases from which they could operate. But these were often in remote areas, 
with building materials in short supply. The first castles, if they were in an important location, would then be rebuilt with more permanent materials. Sometimes stone, but most typically of brick, because this is a low-lying marshy area, you don't find much good stone. Brick isn't normally thought of as being a medieval material, even though it had been around since Roman times, and perhaps still less for building castles. But bricks could be either made in country or transported quickly on the rivers. It meant forts could be thrown up quickly by teams of bricklayers, almost like sandbag defences in 20th century war. Those forts and castles gradually grew in scale until they, were the, they reached the size of the magnificent remnants that we have now in, in Poland and elsewhere. It took many years and huge resources but Marlborg Castle, the Teutonic Knights capital, was steadily built up and expanded into one of the greatest fortresses of any of the military orders. Yes, Marlborg is uh, the biggest uh, castle, brick castle in the world. The Teutonic order started uh, uh, construction works at the end of the 13th century and finished in the first half of the 15th century. So more than 120 years. More than six million bricks were used to build this castle. It's about 20 hectares. And this castle in the Middle Ages was never taken by the uh, enemy forces. It's staggering to think though, that just 75 years ago, this exceptional castle lay in ruins. As the Second World War drew to a close, Marlburg Castle was used as a stronghold by Nazi German troops. It overlooked the railway the Germans were using to evacuate troops from the Russian front. This and the castle's associations with the Nazis' Teutonic propaganda meant that the Red Army spared little thought for Marlburg's value to posterity. But since the war, a huge project saw the rebuilding of Marlburg to something like its original architectural grandeur. Archaeologists and historians worked together to interpret what they found in the process. Karol Poljolski is a curator at Malbork Castle. The Teutonic Order engineers took the decision to build the first part of the castle, this part. He's exploring here the vaulted chambers beneath the high castle, the first parts built by the Teutonic Knight engineers. We are at the moment uh, in the oldest part of the castle in Marburg. Uh, uh, the construction work started here about 1278, 79. Even this far underground, the walls have been partially restored, but this reveals detail of some of the original building materials. We see here the original stones from the 13th century, original bricks from the same period. But here we can see the modern bricks from the uh, 20th century used during the reconstruction works. The Teutonic Order didn't want Malbork to be simply a stronghold. They were a religious order, so it was also their convent. The entrance to the castle's church, the Order's cathedral, contained a reminder that as soldiers of God, their original spiritual home still lay in the far-off Holy Land. This is the Golden Gate, the main entrance to the Teutonic Order's church in the castle of Marburg. Uh, I am of the opinion that this gate, Golden Gate, this is the gate to the Golden Jerusalem for the Teutonic Knights. It was very important to connect their new uh, capital convent, capital, castle, with the Jerusalem. Because the Teutonic Order, it was the, the order of the St. Mary of the Germans in Jerusalem. Only members of the Teutonic and military orders, or important churchmen or dignitaries, could pass here into the Church of St. Mary, the main church in the Teutonic Order's state in Prussia. This is the most important place in the Teutonic Order Castle in Marburg. 
and this is the most important church in the Teutonic Order. The first construction works were done in the 1280s of the 13th century. And uh, during the 14th century, the church uh, was richly decorated. Very little survived the Second World War or the Red Army's occupation in the aftermath. But it's thought that the order's holy relics were stored or displayed here, including a tangible link to the crucifixion itself. The most precious, the most important was the fragment, the piece of the true cross. We know that the Teutonic order received it from the King of France in the 70s, 80s of the 14th century. It was so important to have relics in the churches because the people need to contact with the saints, with the objects connected with the passion of the Christ. And it was important to collect for pilgrims who arrived here in the 14th and 15th century. Pilgrims were vital to the order as they brought with them money in the form of donations. And in return, the brothers showed off the order's relics. They included nobles from across Europe, including in 1390, Henry Bolingbroke, future King Henry IV of England. The raison d'etre of the order, as they saw it, was holy war. And pilgrims brought more than just their money. Teutonic Order is known also as a military organization. We can see here two long swords from the first half of the 14th century. These swords were found nearby the castle and they bear the telltale inscriptions of religious warriors. This sword is very interesting because we can see here the Jerusalem cross. This is the symbol of the Crusades. Crusades, of course, Palestine, but in the 14th century, the knights coming here from Western Europe were crusaders too. They fought in the name of Christ against the pagans, against the Lithuanians. Lithuania was the next country that the Teutonic Order coveted and invaded. Like the Prussians, the Lithuanians too were Baltic pagans. Their land as well was a wilderness, even further from Western Europe. But beyond lay the trade routes to Russia and to Asia. The distances were greater, and so one kind of transport became even more important. A striking feature of the Teutonic Knights and their campaigns in the Baltic was how they used rivers in order to move more rapidly. The main rivers of the Baltic states area of northern Poland were, and to some extent remain, major arteries of trade. At the time of the Northern Crusades, they were also major arteries of warfare, raiding, counter-raiding, supplying your forces in the field. In winter, the rivers freeze even the big ones. So you end up with a smooth, icy, reasonably accessible route from where you are deep into the enemy territory. The order pushed north and east from Prussia, and historians and archeologists can now trace the routes they took. That is why most of the castles which survive, the locations, were on rivers. They're not just scattered around. This was to um, secure the rivers, secure crossing points of the rivers, secure junctions of rivers. These castles were put in places with great thought. But some of the castles the Order built in Lithuania are more than just ruins. Trakai Castle was built by the Teutonic Knights and has survived intact. Today it's one of Lithuania's most important heritage sites. Like Malbork, it was built from stone and brick, and it was both a stronghold and an administrative center for the order. The campaign lasted decades. The fighting was bitter, bloody, and above all for the Teutonic Knights, expensive. 
they needed a breakthrough. In the 1380s, the order launched an offensive that led to what one historian now regards as the possible beginning of the end for the Northern Crusades. In 1384, the Teutonic Knights recaptured a castle at Konas, in what's now central Lithuania. The confluence of the two rivers here, the Neris and the Nemunas, makes the site strategically vital. Control this spot, and you control movement to and from the Baltic Sea on two axes, for hundreds of miles inland. Both sides knew this was a position they had to hold. The order immediately began rebuilding the defences, while the Lithuanian leader, Grand Duke Vitotas, set about laying siege to try to take the castle before it was completed. The Teutonic Knights called the new stronghold after their patron figure, the Virgin Mary, Marienburg. Its exact site has been lost for centuries. The peninsula on which it stood has been fought over many times since. The partially ruined Konas castle that still stands today dates from the period after Marienwerder, and the remains of earlier fortifications can also still be seen. It's a confusing puzzle of battlefield archaeology. Konas historian Vitenis Almanaitis has researched the matter for many years. 1363 metais, dar apgulė didžiulę vokiečių ordino kariuomenę, kuri turėjo daug talkininkų, taip pat buvo atvykę ryterį ir iš Anglijos. Vyko labai atkaklios kovos, ne vieną savaitę, pilį gynė apie 400 gynėjų, gyvi liko tik tai 36 ir pilis buvo užimta. 20 years later, when Vitotas turned the tables and besieged the Teutonic Knights Marienwerde, the fight was no less bloody. The siege opened with hails of missile fire from both defenders and besiegers. Both sides used traditional siege engines and notably many new gunpowder weapons. The Teutonic Knights rained crossbow bolts on the Lithuanians, but this would be a battle settled by a savage artillery duel. A chronicle describes that the Lithuanians lay great store in a large trebuchet, which hammered down huge stone walls on the incomplete brick walls. The Teutonic gun commander responded and himself laid the shot which destroyed the trebuchet. His victory was brief. The commander was beheaded by a Lithuanian shot. The Teutonic Knights fought on a while longer, but in the end they were forced to surrender the castle. The Grand Duke was victorious and became Vitotas the Great. The castle of Marienwerder disappeared from history until perhaps now. Galbūt, 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 žodžiu, ateityje Marienwerder vieta pasisek surasti, nes tai buvo didelė murinė pilis. Ir jos likučiai kažkur čia nerės žiotise, nu, turi būti išlykę, turi būti išlykę. Tai kol kas mes nieko labai ypatingo neradome, bet 2015 metais neris buvo labai, labai nusekusi. Time and tides mean that the riverbanks here are different now than in the late 14th century. It's likely there was a small island or natural cove which the order exploited for its castle. The place would be ideal for reinforcement from its ships, which likely brought in every single brick used to build the defences. The low water in 2015 revealed clues. Ir tada buvo pastebėta, kad vat šitoje vat maždaug vat vietoje Tai yra apie 500 metrų nuo Kauno pilies, dugne, upės dugne yra daug senų plytų. Pasisekė surasti netgi vieną beveik sveiką plytą. Galbūt ta plyta yra iš Kauno pilies, kuri yra netoliese, bet galim atlikti palyginimą. 
Štai šita plita yra tikrai iš Prūsijos. Iš Prūsijoje maždaug tais pačiais metais statytos pabėtų pabėten vokiškai bažnyčios. O mes žinome, kad kai statė Marin Verder, tai plytos buvo atvežtos iš Prūsijos čia. Ir šita plyta yra standartinė. Yra viena pėda ilgio. Ir štai galime tas plytas palyginti. O čia yra plyta iš pabėtų, o čia plyta iš šitos vietos. Galim pasižiūrėti. Pavyzdžiui, jų plotis. Toks pats. Jų aukštis. Toks pats. Jos iš galo atrodo taip pat. Viską apibendrinus tikimybė, kad kada nors ši ypatinga istorinė vieta bus surasta, egzistuoja. The Battle of Mariam Verda is perhaps the greatest Lithuanian victory. Never again would the Teutonic Knights hold the rivers here at Konas. Never again would they penetrate as far east into Lithuania. Within the German Empire and the Papacy, questions were asked of the order and its seemingly endless war in the Baltic. By the time you get to the late 14th century, with the conversion of the big, powerful Duchy of Lithuania to Christianity, there's no more pagans to fight, but the Teutonic Order is still there, and it will be there for several more centuries. So what's it for? Its raison d'etre seems to have disappeared. Its main initial raison d'etre has disappeared. No more pagans to fight. Just over 20 years later, some 50 miles west of Konas, the fate of the Order was sealed. The Germans called it Tannenberg, the Poles, Grunwald. To the Lithuanians, it was Zalgiris. Teutonic troops faced an opposing allied Lithuanian and Polish army. The Teutonic Knights overreached themselves and were destroyed at the Battle of Tannenberg by a, a combination of Poles and Lithuanians and, and so on. But that was really a political misjudgment as much as a military failing. The Teutonic army was defeated was a crushing victory for the Lithuanians and Poles, the greatest ever inflicted on the Christian military order. The end of the Teutonic order is at the hands of fellow Christians. In 1929, the Teutonic Knights as a military order were once and for all dissolved. Yet the order remains today as a charitable organization in many countries. With the benefit of hindsight and history, it can now perhaps be seen in perspective. I think that the Teutonic Order is still important in the religious life of the people in Western Europe. For Polish people, Teutonic Order is not only an eternal enemy. Now we can say that Teutonic Order was an element of the medieval life in Europe.